class. Welcome to the final segment in Lecture 12. And in this final segment, we will talk a little bit more about the thermal wind relationship and take a look at some more uh, physical consequences that arise from the idea of the thermal wind. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Excuse me. So you may recall from the previous, uh, the previous uh, segment, hopefully I can talk straight. So as you recall from the previous segment, this was the mathematical result that we got from that derivation, that really long derivation. And if we want to, we can sometimes, a lot of times you'll see this uh, left-hand side, instead of expressed as geostrophic wind at pressure two minus geostrophic wind at pressure one, sometimes you will also see that written as the geostrophic wind at the upper level minus the geostrophic wind at the lower level, just to sort of uh, make things a little bit more straightforward. But I want to focus on this vector quantity right here. So here I have a vector subtraction going on. The geostrophic one in the upper level minus the geostrophic one at the lower level. Now, to sort of simplify things down for what we're about to show, I want to go ahead and actually rearrange this term so that instead of having rearrange the terms of this equation so that instead of having a vector subtraction, I have a vector addition, which is a lot easier to and a lot simpler to work with. So if we do that, we get that the geostrophic uh, wind at some upper level must be equal to the thermal wind vector plus the geostrophic wind at the lower level. So let's actually take a look at an example of when we of uh, when we might apply that. So if we have so here I've got a geostrophic wind at 850 millibars represented by this line, and I have a geostrophic wind vector at 500 millibars represented by this line. And if we have a vector addition that's relatively straightforward, we just simply take the tail of one vector and attach it to the tip of the other vector. So here I have geostrophic one at a lower level, which is this vector right here. And then we're adding that to our thermal wind vector. So if we're using the tail on tip method, that means the, tip, the tail of the thermal wind goes on the tip of the geostrophic one at a lower level, and then that thermal wind vector, the tail goes here and the tip goes toward the resultant here. So if you didn't have, if we didn't have this uh, geostrophic one at an upper level and we just did this vector plus the thermal wind vector, the lower vector plus the thermal wind vector, then that would mean the resultant, that is the end result, the addition would look like this geostrophic wind vector that's at the upper level. Or put in more simpler terms, to get the thermal wind given a geostrophic wind vector at a lower level and an upper level, just simply take the tail of the thermal wind, attach it to the tip of the geostrophic wind at the lower level, and then connect that vector with the tip of the geostrophic wind vector at the upper level. And hopefully that makes sense. You might need to walk through that uh, a few more times before it will start to make more intuitive sense. But if we apply that logic, just uh, just sort of an extension of the idea of a vector sum. If we apply that logic, we take the tail of the thermal wind vector, attach it to the tip of the geostrophic wind vector at the lower level. So lower geostrophic wind, attach the tail of the thermal wind to the tip of that, the tip of this vector, and then we connect that with the tip of the geostrophic wind at the upper level to get our thermal wind vector represented by the red arrow here. Now you may also remember from the previous segment, if we have a thermal wind vector drawn, which we do, that means that I've got to have warmer air to the right of the thermal wind and colder air to the left of the thermal wind. And also, you'll notice that as we go from the lower level to the upper level, the winds are turning clockwise with height. And this is referred to as a veering wind profile or just simply veering winds. And you'll also notice that if I've got warmer air over here, colder air over here, you'll notice that these wind vectors are trying to blow the warmer air towards the colder air. So that would imply that we have warm air advection going on. And in general, you can actually generalize this. If you've got winds that are turning clockwise with height, that is, if you've got veering winds, then that implies that you've got warm air advection occurring uh, throughout the course of that layer or throughout the depth of that layer, I should say. And this, uh, this whole idea of warm air advection occurring in the presence of winds turning clockwise with height, that is warm air advection occurring in the presence of veering winds, that all is explained by the idea of thermal wind. So let's take a look at a different example. So here I've got geostrophic wind vector, same pressure levels. Here's my lower pressure level and here's my upper uh, pressure level. 
And if I want to do the same thing that we did before, so take the tail of the thermal wind vector, attach it to the tip of the lower geostrophic vector, and then connect that connect the tip of the thermal wind vector to the tip of the upper geostrophic wind vector to get this result, that would be my thermal wind vector. And again, by the way we've defined thermal wind, I've got to have warmer air to the right of the thermal wind, colder air to the left of the thermal wind vector. So that gives me a profile that looks like this. And just based on the direction this wind is blowing here, that implies that I've got colder air being blown towards warmer air, which then implies that I've got colder air advection going on. And if we go uh, if we go vertical, as we go from the lower level to the upper level, you'll see that the winds are in fact turning counterclockwise with height. And this is what's referred to as a backing wind profile or backing winds. And just based on the thermal wind relationship, and we can generalize this just based on the thermal wind relationship, if we've got winds turning counterclockwise with height, that is if we have backing winds, that would imply that we have colder advection happening throughout the depth of that layer. So that's great and all. However, there are a couple of restrictions that we have to keep in mind, and those restrictions kind of stem from the very basic definition that we started with. So we, we derive this thermal wind equation using the concept of geostrophic wind. So that would then imply that thermal wind is only applicable, it will only truly represent the atmosphere if the flow is geostrophic, if the flow is approximately geostrophic. So if there's a place in the atmosphere where that's not the case, then thermal wind is not going to work so well. And one example of that might be near the equator. Geostrophic wind is not well modeled near the equator because of that 1 over F term that appears out in front. So thermal wind doesn't work so well down there. However, I also want to go back to an example that we looked at when we introduced the idea of friction in the atmosphere. So uh, again, thermal wind not applicable if the flow is not geostrophic. Now you may remember from, I believe it was lecture seven, when we showed how the wind naturally wants to turn clockwise with height as you go from the surface, from near the surface to uh, higher levels in the atmosphere. So you remember, you may remember from, you may remember from previous lectures this di this exact diagram. So the wind wants to turn clockwise with height. The way the thermal wind relationship that would imply that we have veering winds, which would imply that we have warm air advection. However, in the actual atmosphere, we see veering winds in the lowest one to two kilometers all the time, but that doesn't always mean that you've got warm air advection occurring. So even though you've got winds turning clockwise with height in the lowest one to two kilometers, yes, the winds are veering, but that doesn't mean that you've got warm air advection. That doesn't guarantee that you have warm air advection. You could have warm air advection, but there's no way to know for sure because the wind normally wants to do that anyway. But it does turn out in practice that if you've, if you've got backing winds in the lowest one to two kilometers, then you can for sure say that you've got colder advection. Because the wind on its own, just leaving a, just letting friction run its course, the wind on its, own, on its own wants to veer with height as you go from the surface up to, say, one or two kilometers. So if the wind is actually backing, that means uh, force of friction is pretty much irrelevant when you're thinking about uh, geostrophic when you're thinking about geostrophic balance the wind is backing it doesn't friction doesn't really matter at that point the fact that the wind is backing is deviating from its normal tendency of veering the fact that it's backing would definitely imply that you've got colder advection going on and if you look at some soundings that have cold front passages which is what the technical term for that is and you'll talk more about this in your synoptic laboratory in your senior year but you can see how you can tell what the depth of the cold front is by seeing uh how de how, uh, how much the wind backs. So at the altitude where the wind stops backing with height, that's basically how high the cold front is above the ground. But you'll talk more about that in some of your synoptic classes. But just to reiterate and to reemphasize, thermal wind is only applicable if you've got a situation where geostrophic wind is also applicable. So that means you can't use th thermal wind near the equator, and thermal wind also does not apply itself very well when if you've got significant friction, which is usually in the lowest one to two kilometers of the atmosphere. So that's going to do it for the lecture on thermal wind as well as trajectories and streamlines. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture where we talk about uh, where we talk about uh, scales of motion. So with that, I will see you all there.